Um, well, for, you know, for me in a way, I mean, I, and I will proceed as if, uh, as if sound and music are kind of one and the same because they kind of are to me in a way. Um, I, I knew that I wanted to make a film, a crime film that was that that took itself very seriously and that had underpinning it a very a, a kind of uh, a, a constant sense of menace um, and for that reason I knew I wanted to have a, a score that was that had that um, a certain darkness and melancholy to it that um, and, and an austerity as well that that um, would lend would would lend itself to that uh, to that tension and menace you know, it was one of the reasons why I didn't want to make a kind of, you know, sort of rock and roll crime film uh, in in that sort of heightened universe that crime films so often exist in these days because I felt that that would be counter to my... Um, I felt that would be, uh, you know, counterproductive in my larger mission to create a film with a, with, with, with a genuine underlying menace. Um, it needed to have that austerity and it needed to have... Um, it needed to take itself seriously in order to achieve that. I mean, Sam Petty, who who did the sound design for the film, I've worked with a number of times before, and, and in some ways, I think nobody does um, that that beautiful and poetic darkness and menace better than he does. You know, he's done it on a uh, a, a number of my shorts, and uh, he started with a, a an Australian, a great Australian film called The Boys, which. Um, which is incredibly menacing. Um, it seems that a lot of, of the things that I think of as effective are, are a matter of subtraction yeah. or a matter of uh, the, the house that the, the family lives in seems to be very damped. That there's some yeah. yeah, no, I kind of, I think, um, and I think Sam was thinking this about this quite a lot as well, but I knew I wanted that house, the nature of that house, even just on a location level, to feel a little bit like a cave or like a, a bunker in which these kind of sweaty animals were lounging in, in this maddening heat. And for that reason, it did feel like, you know, it. I wanted there to be a certain stillness in there. But this is true of the film generally, I think, that, you know, when wanting to have a film in which those acts of violence feel like they explode out of nowhere and, and happen, they're, they're, they're gone before you realise what's happened, requires that there be a certain embrace of stillness and silence. And um, and Sam, you know, it's... I mean, I, I'm sure this is true of many sound designers, but I'm constantly amazed at, at the the level of detail, uh, you know, the richness of detail in every single scene that, that to many people probably goes totally unnoticed but is so profoundly um, contributive to the, the overall experience of... What, when did you the first film? discover and realise that sound could be so powerful psychologically? Because the idea is that a viewer is hearing that and all of that is like making you uneasy or making you angry or whatever and it, you don't know that it's wreaking that power on you I have no idea and I'm probably sh I'm sure there's some kind of psychophysiological explanation for the way in which sound interacts with the brain but you know I think I started to realize this when I started to realize that I mean I still have this experience when I go to to introduce screenings or whatever you know I'll go in there and all I'm ever worried about is the sound. I'm quite happy to go in there and see that the thing's out of focus or the print is terrible, so long as it sounds good. And, and I die inside when I have to sit through the film and the sound isn't working properly. Um, because I think there's something, you know, the, the, I, I don't know, maybe people's ears are more finely tuned to detail than, than their eyes are in a way. Well, Bresson was one of the people who, I mean, essentially he was saying that he thought that sound in his films was subjective, where images are finite. No matter how much you design them, how much you've refined the palette, it's still concrete, finite. Sound is our own brain soup. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, I, I have no idea. I just know. I mean, you know, in part, I wonder whether or not I just love the sound and music part of the process because it's right at the end of the process. You know, all of the the pain and the suffering I've been through is is uh, um, you know it ends with that that kind of the the beauty and the quiet of being in the world of sound and music. You know, working closely with beautiful souls like Sam Petty and, and Anthony Partos, the, uh, the composer, just l- elevating the thing, you know, making it, making it better, making it sing and making it feel whole, making it feel complete. I was talking one time to Andrew Nichol about his films, which all have through and through original scores. And I said, why do you do an original score every time? And he goes, I feel it would be irresponsible not to put more good music out into the world. Yeah. I, if I, I have the opportunity to have someone like Michael Nyman do a score and they'll pay for it, that's my responsibility to, as a filmmaker is to... Mm. No, it's true. I mean, you can do, as, and as Luke Dolan, the editor, and I did, you know, we very heavily and very specifically temp scored the film while we were cutting it. You know, because I, I really like cutting to music um, because music such an integrally important part of the overall experience I, I can't imagine not cutting to music but finding those pieces of music anyway that just happen to naturally perfectly fit in the, in the film um, is a rare occurrence and, and there is something so I mean, I love it. I, I love... It's one of the things I love about cinema in general is that, uh, you know, it's that, that grand mash of all different art forms, you know. And music's a weird one that I really love, but it's also one where I find myself least capable of speaking the language, you know, which is which is fascinating in itself. And you, I find myself, in the course of that, speaking to a composer, or in this instance, Anthony, the way I would... Um, an actor or a production designer, you break it down into talking about life and character and and, um, and um, subtext and you know and it's uh, but but strangely having to wrangle at the same time a, a clumsy musical language, my clumsy musical language. Anthony speaks it fluently, you know. Um, but I love that. I love feeling stretched on that level. 